Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another Journey on the Fly podcast where we talk about fly fishing and life. And going to take a small break and intersect some methodologies for winter fly fishing over the next couple weeks. We're going to go back and forth with some interviews. I want to keep that format going because it makes sense. And let's be honest, I don't want you to have to sit and listen to me chat by myself about what I think I know every single one of these podcasts and because to be truthful I don't want this podcast to be just about me and what I think I know I want us all to learn and grow about life and fly fishing through the eyes and the lens of all these other guests that I'm bringing on and I have a number of good guests lined up I'm really excited about from fly fishing guides we're going to talk about steelhead fishing We're going to talk about um, the art of angling, meaning we're going to discuss some uh, where where art and fly fishing kind of intersect in in that whole world with a couple local Pittsburgh-ish artists and a few other guys and gals that we have lined up that I'm excited for you all to hear from. For the meantime, hang in there. This is Journey on the Fly. We're going to talk about fly fishing and life. So this week, I'm going to just take a couple minutes and introduce winter fly fishing. It is that time of year that, man, things can get cold. Although we are having some freakishly 60 degree weather right now, that doesn't always happen and it isn't going to last. And trout season, in the, in the, uh, as a, using an, an illustration from my own life, My son asked me back in, I think it was October, he said, Dad, when does trout season start again? And I lowered my head in great disappointment. I shrugged my shoulders and shook my head in disappointment to myself. And I said, son, I have left you down. He's like, what do you mean, Dad? I'm like, trout season never closes in this house. And the reason that he said that is that there's a pretty low pressure relationship uh, between myself and my son when it comes to fishing. I don't want to overwhelm him with it, but I want him to enjoy it. And he does when we do, but he's a teenager and he does have other things going on right now. But that is not me slacking off. We go fishing. Actually, he caught his first steelhead, oh, about a month ago, and it was a pretty exciting day for him to catch a 20-inch fish. And he said his arm was hurting. And as he's fighting this fish, it was just, uh, it was so exciting with him for him because he's like, I just didn't know which way to go. Uh, there was so much happening all at one time. And what a rewarding time to be out there on the water with him. So trout fishing in the wintertime changes, right? Temperatures drop everywhere. Air temps are dropped. The air gets drier. There's very little bug activity as far as, you know, mayflies and stoneflies and, um, uh, caddis flies, but there are hatches that take place on these streams this time of year. And even if there's no hatches happening where you can key in on them, as maybe the fish are keying in on them top water, there are hatches, there are things going on, there is pupating, and there is larva stages that are consistent in the trout world. And it's important that we approach it from a trout's perspective, the best that we can. So what does trout fishing look like in the winter time? So I'm usually a guy that the second thing I do before I begin to fish on a stream is take a temperature of the water, because that will always tell me with quite a, quite an amount of precision where that fish will be in the column in the water itself, whether it's in the deep pool or, you know, kind of resting stage, if you will, front of pools, head of pools, riffles, runs, where they're going to be is dictated so much by their environment and thereby by their uh, energy expenditure levels, right? And the hotter and the colder temperatures put those fish on hold in a sense. They're still feeding. They're absolutely still feeding. Fish don't feed, fish starve. It's not like they go into hibernation. Fish don't just go on to autopilot 
and something inside of them, you know, causes their fins to move appropriately in current. They don't just fall asleep because if that would happen, they'd get washed away. There'd be no fish left in the system at all. So with these temperature drops, with the air temperature and the water temperature drops, fish simply become a little more lethargic. They have a tendency in their design to not move as much and expend as much uh, uh, um, physical energy to burn calories. Because if they do, because they're a cold-blooded critter, that will kill them. Too much energy in super high and super low temperatures being expended will kill these fish. So it's, it's a little bit like when we get a heavy storm and the news people are always telling everybody that doctors are saying that if you're overweight or whatever, please don't go out and shovel snow because you could give yourself a heart attack under those severe conditions. It's a bit like that. Only trout are, you know, kind of, they, they don't, they get fat. Sure, we call them fat, but they grow to their environment in a sense. And, um, and of course, the, the length of survival. So you have these low temperatures and it means a couple things for you and it means a couple things for the fish. One of the things that means for you, since we already talked a little bit about what the fish begin to do, slow down, hit the brakes, is you need to stay warm and dry all at the same time. So the first thing I want to talk about in a little bit of detail when it comes to winter fishing methods is you being safe on the stream. And there's a couple things that come to my mind right away. First of all, you're not going to wear felt bottom shoes. Do not go out in the wintertime when there is snow on the ground. And realistically, even if there isn't, when the temperatures are freezing or below and fish with felt bottom shoes. And here's the reason. They will absorb water. They will freeze. And if there's snow on the ground, or even if there's not, you are going to get the Christmas story version of putting your tongue on the uh, flagpole when it comes to your shoes sticking to everything or everything sticking to your shoes. And before you know it, you're walking around with giant piles of snow and ice attached to your shoes and it becomes incredibly unsafe. So you're going to want rubber bottom shoes with some kind of spikes. I recommend a carbided tip spike that has a large arbor on it or auger on it to dig in and stay in stay away from the hex heads because what happens with those over a couple trips they either come out or they simply erode away and become worse than what they originally were intended to be they become smooth hard surface on smooth hard surfaces and those two things just don't mix the next thing i want you to think about is not putting a hundred pairs of socks on just like in the wintertime, if you're ever camped, the more air you can get to move around inside of your sleeping bag, that is warm air, but not too much, the better circulation there'll be in there for temperature regulation and for moisture regulation. If you put a bunch of socks on and you pack your foot inside that shoe, like you're packing a cannon full of, of, of wads of, of, of uh, backing, you are going to regret it because when your shoes, when your feet begin to perspire, there will be no room for that perspiration to go anywhere. And it's going to sit there and it's going to make your feet cold. I was fishing a week ago on a Thursday and I was in above my waist in extremely cold water, about 30 degree water, 32 degree water or so. And, well, it was a little above freezing, of course. It was like 33, 34. I apologize. And I knew better because I was catching fish that I should have gotten out of there. I should have at least taken a longer break. When I was finished, I couldn't feel my feet for about an hour. Then the rest of the day, they burned. Why? Well, because hypothermia was sitting in or frostbite was sitting in. And that's not good. That was foolish of me to do. But the interesting thing is, is how long it took me to get to that point. With that cold temperature, the biggest thing that got me that cold that quick 
uh, in a sense, was because I had put myself in above my hips in freezing cold water. Don't do that. <laughs> um, so you want good socks. If I could recommend any socks, I'm going to recommend 100% merino wool or at least something 60 to 80% in the blend. Merino wool not only removes moisture, it helps air it off and dry it off, but you can wear those. They have a naturally built-in antimicrobial element to them. And they regulate your temperature in the cold and in the heat incredibly well for a pair of socks. Same thing goes with your base layers. I don't want you putting 500 layers of base layers on because you need to be able to move. You need to be able to breathe. You need to be able to uh, expend or to, to uh, gas off the moisture that's being trapped in there. So I'm going to recommend a, a good merino wool blend on that as well. As a matter of fact, I wear a product by uh, Wool X, and I believe it's W-O-O-L-X with the, the letter X. Um, they are uh, New Zealand merino wool. They are a bit expensive, which is why I don't own a, a whole, too many at all, uh, but they're going to last me a long, long time. I wear their Blizzard version or whatever it is. It's super heavy stuff. And a lot of times that's all I wear under my waders because it works so well. You could add an additional layer on top of it and it helps, but it isn't always necessary. So with that said, do not wear anything that does not wick your moisture. Don't put cotton on. Cotton will kill you as far as regulating temperature. Moving up, the same thing goes for the upper body. Keep that core warm. I found an interesting thing is I've just recently switched back to a chest pack using the, the Umpqua chest pack is that when I put hand warmers in that uh, chest pocket of my, my chest waders and then I have my chest uh, pack over top of it, interesting enough, that warms my core, which then in course in, in time takes that warm blood through all my extremities. It is a very simple way to add heat regulation to your, your system of, of clothing. And we need to treat it as a system because this is important. Your safety is more important than catching fish. We'll get to the fish catching. So once you have kind of your core worked out and you're, you, you've addressed the top much like the bottom with some good base layers and a, and a decent coat over top of that, be willing to crack that coat on your way in and your way out to regulate your temperature. When you're standing still, you're gassing or giving off, you're losing body temperature. You're not producing much. You're not burning calories. Your metabolism isn't really moving too fast. So you're going to cool down. Keep your head covered. Wear a good hat, whether it's a merino wool hat or whether it's an alpaca hat. My wife just recently for my birthday bought me this amazing lightweight alpaca hat and man do those alpacas pack a punch when it comes to warmth uh, alpacas again it's more expensive because it's a, a lot greater product than cotton or just a you know a normal knit hat but man is it worth it yes absolutely so then one of the worst things to keep warm is your fingers and there's some tech stuff I'll bring in here in just a minute for your feet and, and, and a little bit for the, your core. But, but just, just on a kind of the everyday redneck type of version, the way I kind of go out there is I wear a pair of $15 Fox River wool gloves, fingerless. Everybody says, well, fingerless, man, your little tips are out there. They're going to get cold. And they do get cold. But I've sewn a little pocket under the wrist. And then there, I put a hand warmer. And that warms more of my blood heading to my extremities. And there are days I've been on the water where it's been pretty cold in mid to low 40s, upper 30s. And my hands were perspiring because of the warmth that was being generated right there. Is it a perfect thing? No, there isn't such a thing as perfect when it comes to that. You're in extreme temperatures and you got your little fingers sticking out. You need your fingers to tie flies and, and to do delicate things on the water. So you either have the choice of wearing some kind of mitten and then constantly taking them off or rolling them back. And they don't really even keep you that warm. These hand, this hand warmer trick against your skin, or not so much against your skin, I don't want to recommend that, but 
uh, close contact with your skin through some kind of a fabric on the wrist is a fantastic way to warm your hands up. So on the tech side of stuff, you can get, and I have not used them. This has come from people, I've, other uh, uh, fishermen and fisher ladies that I've talked to. That is, you can get these heated socks that, that these, some of these people are swearing by. Now, there's two downfalls to them. One, when you put them on high, the batteries don't last that long. So on extreme conditions, when your feet are down in freezing cold water for a few hours, well... You're going to want those babies on high. And the only way to get in there and get the new battery is to take your waders down. So that's one downside. The other downside is, as I've noticed from strolling online, taking a peek on them, they range about $80 to $120. Now, if you're out in this all the time and you are just, in a sense, a cold-blooded dude or woman, maybe that's something you want to invest in. It's not where I'm at yet. Um... Maybe somebody can send me something and I'll try them out for you, but I just, I'm, I'm not willing to pay 80 bucks for a pair of socks. <laughs> you know, call me cheap. I don't care. Another thing that I want to recommend, and this is a silly thing, but man, is it effective. So a buddy of mine used to tell me that when him and his family would take a vacation, his uncle would drive. And when his uncle would get tired, he would pull over onto the berm of the road, put his four ways on, get out, run to the end of his headlights where they shined at night, and run back to the car. What's he doing? He's getting his blood pumping. He's warming himself up. He's getting his metabolism going. And that blood now, warmed up, moving through the body, is going to get you warm. Now, I'm not telling you to run on the water, run upstream, or anything like that. Here's what I am telling you. If any of you have ever watched the movie Tommy Boy... There's a scene at a gas station where the one gentleman, I think it's David Spade that plays him, starts to spray Tommy Boy with a, um, a water hose. So Tommy Boy does the Tommy Boy splash dance dance, right? He's there, you know, I'm a maniac, maniac. You know, go to YouTube and search Tommy Boy water scene. It is worth it. You'll see what I mean. Get out of the water, set your gear down, and jog in place for a minute. I am telling you, it's a tremendous help. If you want to be out there in these temperatures, friends, the first step is to be safe. These are a couple things that I literally do myself. Sometimes when there's other people around, they get a kick out of the Tommy Boy thing, right? But I also get warm from it. I don't mind looking a little stupid on the stream. I look stupid in the mirror. So, you know, that's why I'm doing a podcast. Uh, well, I guess I can't say I have a YouTube channel too, but I was going to say my mom always said that I have a face for radio. <clears throat> no comment from any of you out there on that. But the point is, is that winter fishing, trout season's still open. Let's go after those fish, but let's do it safely. So think about those things. If you got any other additional ideas, comments, suggestions, things that work for you, man, give us some comments. Let us know. Shoot me an email. I mean, my email is real simple. It's adam at journeyonthefly.fish. And with that said, find us on Instagram and Facebook and chat with us. Let us know what's going on in the world of trout fishing. Give us some ideas. Next uh, uh period where we're going to talk about a little bit of methodology for winter fishing we'll talk about kind of the rig what's it look like um, does it change and then we'll, we'll we'll begin to approach the stream and get into the the mind of a trout and hopefully we can add some flies to your arsenal get you tying some flies right now and get you using those flies as well and keep your skills honed for the coming spring season that's just around the corner so until the next time keep your lines wet Keep your flies in the fish's mouth. God bless. This is Journey on the Fly. See ya.